All right, so we've moved out of uh, formation and classification, all that boring stuff, the, the soil orders and the subsurface horizons. And now we're gonna move into kind of the physical space. We did texture, um, texture by feel. We talked about some of the, uh, the, the particle sizes. And so now we're gonna talk about how those particle sizes and the way that they're distributed and kind of set on top of each other, how that influences water movement. So again, we're moving on that left side of that <coughs> pie chart. We've determined bulk density and know that that's all that air space. Now, some of that's going to be filled up with water. Um, I'm probably not going to tell you anything you don't know, um, but just part of soils, you know, we have this uh, uh, polar compound and it is attached to itself through hydrogen bonding. And so water moving through these pores is not going to be perfectly straight down because if you remember I talked about, we had those platy particles and that water needs to travel like this, right? So it's not going to travel straight, perfectly straight down. It will move and kind of, it might meander a little bit. And also something else that I was thinking about with this pores filled with air is that if you have a lot of water uh, infiltrate your soil very quickly, where does the air go? Does, it, does all of it escape out the side? Does it escape at all? So think about if you have a soil and you put a whole bunch of water on top of it and it starts to infiltrate and it meets that air pocket what happens to it eventually there's enough pressure that kind of holds that water above the air so imagine if we pushed so this is all air in here Imagine if we pushed all that air down at one time. There was enough water that, that kind of flooded this environment, pushed it all down, we would get this. This would now push all the air to the bottom and we would have all this water in the top. <coughs> so like air, like how much air is actually in the soil is going to influence where the water can and can't go, depending on how those pores are lined up. So as our pore size decrease uh, with smaller particle size, so we have a, a more of a clay loam soil or a clay soil, um, our surface area is going to increase. And so clay is less than two microns. That's microscopic. But you have like 38 billion of them in this one little teaspoon, possibly, making up that so that's larger surface area. Because of that surface area and the way that those pores are set up, we can have capillary rise or capillary action, which is that movement against gravity. Um, have you ever noticed that it might rain and you're walking to class or whatever, and you look down and all of a sudden your, your, your pant leg is kind of wet? And you're like, how that, I didn't step in any puddles. How come my pant is wet all the way up to my calf? Well, that's capillary rise. There's enough pore spaces in the fibers of your gene that that water will move a little bit. It may not be all the way up to your calf, but there might be two inches of, of water that kind of moves up. And you're like, but I didn't step in any puddles. But just a little bit of dragging your feet and catching a little bit of water that's on the, maybe a little puddle, starts to pick that moisture up. And I'll give a demonstration on that in just a moment. So there are two forces uh, that, that kind of uh, work with this capillary action. And so one is adhesion. When I think of adhesion, I'm thinking like tape, right? Adhesive tape. So non, unlike surfaces. And then cohesion is uh, ad an adhesion to other water molecules, so that hydrogen bonding. 
So I'm thinking like I had this kind of sticky tape. And you can see here that this is adhesion to the side, uh, maybe um, a glass tube or our xylem, which carries water from the soil up to the plant and performs photosynthesis because that's part of the photosynthetic equation, right? Six carbon dioxides and six waters gives us glucose and oxygen. And so depending on the pore sizes, See the water start to rise up the sponge. And if I pour some of the sponge. Now you can see it moving up the back side real well. And you'll see how that kind of moved up right in the center. Oh, I don't want to spill that on anyone. See how that's moving up over time? And sometimes it's right in the center, so it's not consistently. It's not perfect all the way up. We'll leave that there and see how long it takes for all that water to dissipate. So that's the capillary action. And those, some, some of the pores inside that sponge are small, and some of the pores inside of it are large. So the smaller the <coughs> diameter of the pore, the greater the capillary rise. So in which soil type would you expect to find the greater capillary rise? A sand or a clay? 50-50. Which one? <laughs> it was like, I didn't know what that means. 50-50, <laughs> someone throw something out there. Cyan. In the sand? So sand would have a larger micro, micro or macro pore space. Think about micro. Oh, you know, micro or macro. Micro meaning small, macro meaning large. Sand is smaller. I mean fine sand. Okay, so the yeah. fine sand. Fine, but smaller particle size, right? Smaller pore space. Yeah. So sand, so this question was asking, Fine sand versus coarse sand. Yeah, fine sand. The fine sand would because that pore space is smaller. Now what about between a sand and a clay? The, the clay would because they're so, right? We, yeah. we just talked about that. There's 38 billion of them little bitty clay particles and there's a little micro pore space in between there. So each one of those hold an angstrom's worth of water for all you chemistry majors in here. Very, very small unit of water. But there's 38 billion of those pore spaces, and ultimately that adds up over the surface area. So a clay can um, have a greater capillary rise, and then also a sponge. And then also over time as well. So smaller pore space greater capillary rise. <coughs> Next is really gonna be, so I guess uh, um, in a sandy soil, you would have some initial capillary rise and that would go very quick. Because <coughs> the water is going to fill all of that pore space um, through adhesion and cohesion. But at some point in time, the adhesion and cohesive forces in that sand are not going to be greater than that of gravity. So clays and silt loams, as we start to get, and y'all remember this from lab, that sand didn't take much water to, to wet it very well, right? But the, but, but the clay did. You had to put a lot of water in that and mess it and knead it around, and then finally it was full. So clays can hold more, more water than sands can. That's why texture by field is so important. You can walk up to a field and know whether or not they have at least good water holding capacity. And if they don't, well, then that's the reason why your plant dies, because there's no water. <laughs>
We have three uh, terms that we use to describe the water potential in soils. Saturation, which makes sense. Everything's full. We measure that at zero bars. Next, we have field capacity, and that's everything that's held against gravity. We measure that between negative 0.1 and negative 0.33 bars ish, right? So if you noticed it, as the water content decreases, the water potential or the pressure potential decreases as well. So as water becomes more net, as the soil becomes more negative, what happens to the water content of that soil? If the pressure continues to become negative, what happens to the water? Increases or decreases? We went from full up, we have full saturations, flooded. As we became more negative, where's the water <coughs> go? How much water is there? More or less than at saturation? Less. So that as we reach permanent wilting point. As we become more negative, the water content becomes less. And we measure this at negative 10 to about negative 15 bars. And so at this point, there may be some water left held to the soil but the plant can't get it. The, uh, the matrix potential of the soil is greater than the uh, kind of the, the sucking force of that plant in order to pull that water into its uh, roots. sponge has stopped. All right, and so there's no more water being pulled up by this sponge. This is the, like the, the, the capillary action is about this high. That's it. It won't pull up anymore. Gravity is too great a force against the capillary action. So that's field capacity. And so if this sponge were not fully soaked, So the sponges that we used in lab, I let them dry over the <coughs> over the week or whatever. So there's still a little bit of water in here, but that's pretty dry, right? I'm about to do some magic trick. I'm asking her to pick a card. <laughs> um, so anyhow, this would be what we would consider field capacity. I mean, I'm sorry, permanent wilting point. There's no, there's a little bit of water in there, but like we can't wring that out. And so you have to think about this is how now we have a uh, it hadn't rained in a long time we've been in a drought and then all of a sudden we get a frog drowner and the soil can't take the water in because it's hydrophobic but if we get a slow a slow rain that water can infiltrate the soil i'm doing this slow so that i don't get everybody wet and you can see that this sponge is also starting to swell, so kind of like a clay. <laughs> 
almost. So as that water is moving through this sponge, that means it is saturated. against the flow of gravity. So now it's at field capacity. It's pretty close, there's still a little bit moving in there. We'll squeeze some of that out. So now there's no more water dripping out and that's at field capacity. And the water will slowly start to decrease as your plants start to take that up. Or there will be some evaporation. And then also, the depth of your soil is going to change that as well. So now that's the weight of the water pulling against gravity. But at some point, you all think this, like up here is losing water, right? But here it's still, like, so that's the way the water's going against the flow of gravity. And once it stops, Turn that over so now we're at field capacity. Now there's just a little bit of water left in that soil. So now we're getting closer to permanent wilting point. So as the water content decreased, we got more negative involved. We're moving closer to permanent wilting point. Clean this mess up. So that's below the soil. So let's think about what's happening above the soil. So water always wants to move from the area of greatest content to lowest content, or it is trying to move towards the more negative end of the spectrum. The outside air has a more negative potential at negative 100, that's bars. At negative 100 bars, so water is either going to move downward or it's also trying to move back upwards. And that's how water moves into the plant. At the top of that tree, it's moving out. So at the top of that tree, that, that water potential, that pressure is negative 100 bars. So now we have two forces pushing against, pulling against that water. Gravity is pulling it into the soil. And once it's in the soil, the plant is pulling it back out because of the pressure potential. Everybody see and understand that? It's kind of like when you leave water on a table. It's going to evaporate. It's why water evaporates. So here just to look at it, we have a full saturation. Some of the water has drained out at field capacity at negative 0.3 bars. And then finally permanent wilting point. You'll notice that there's a small film of water around that soil colloid. That's the matrix potential of that soil. And so here we're looking at showing that at field capacity, somewhere between negative one and negative 10, we start to get into permanent wilting point. And so that as our soil moisture potential is becoming more negative, the soil water is not available. Because scientists love equations and symbols and Greek symbols and subscripts. Um, there's an equation that they calculate how much actual water is there and what the potential is of that. And that's for a completely different discipline of soil science. 
So obviously T is gonna be for total. We have the gravimetric, which is when I filled this sponge up and the water that was coming through, that's the gravimetric that holds it against uh, the flow of gravity. Solute or osmotic potential. So this has to do with salt and diffusion. And so water will move from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. Anyone ever burnt a field? Anybody ever spilled too much fertilizer near, near some grass? Yes, no? So if you over apply fertilizer, what happens is, is the salt potential is so great in that little area that it actually sucks the water out of the plant. So the salt concentration in the soil actually pulls that water out of the plant because it's trying to reach equilibrium. That's what this symbol is indicating. We have the matrix absorption force, and that's right around, that's the, that, that, that's the water that's right around um, that soil colloid that we saw in one or two slides ago. That little film of water. And that is held by adhesion. And then finally we have pressure. Anything less than saturation is going to be negative. That's that negative 0.1 bars. Water moves from areas of high content to low content. And then there are several different measurements for how we measure that. If you were to go into soil physics or something, we would be studying that type of thing, but we're not. Uh, so our gravimetric potential exerts a positive pulling force against the water moving downward. It forces the water to move downward. That was gravity pulling that water out of that sponge or soil profile. also works the same way. If you remember back, we talked about the zones of alleviation, so exiting, that's gravity pulling it downward, but also the same goes where we have a higher moisture content below, but it's drier above, and so that is why the water moved upward. So it can go up against gravity if the soil is drier above. So that's when the water table rises, the water will then move up into, back up into the A horizon or the, up through the B horizon and into the A horizon and carry some of those nutrients with it. And so that's capillary action. This osmotic potential, we're talking about the dissolved salts and they have that positive attraction for water. So as salt content increases, we have a greater negative number because that's, that, that water is not available in the soil. Uh, Dr. Earhart was telling me um, a story about how uh, this, this company was moving tomatoes in water. And what, they, what started happening was by the time they got to the conveyor belt and they were ready to go into the box, they had burst. Like, huh. The salt concentration inside of the tomato was so great that the water was coming out of the river and going into the tomato and it was blowing up and that skin can only hold so much. That's what this symbol is for. It's the salt attracting the water into across that semi-permeable membrane. And then finally the matrix potential. And again, that's just going to be the water that is around that little piece of soil or that soil particle. And so the drier the soil, the larger the negative number. So when I talk about a, a, a soil potential being negative, I would typically call it being more negative. So as soil 
moisture becomes more negative, as the potential becomes more negative, what happens to the water content? More or less? Less. less. And then finally, pressure. So you add all those together, it comes up with a value, and that tells scientists how much uh, soil, I mean, how much water that soil can actually hold, and when, how long it will take in order to uh, evaporate or be used up by the plant. There's a ton of equations that go into that. Uh, but for the most part, we just need to understand that there are about five forces that kind of play a role in how soil water and how soil water moves in the soil. And again, I'll bring you back to this to understand that this is all coming from the soil into the root, up the xylem, and then out the top of the tree through adhesion and cohesion based upon the pressure potential. Real simple. And then back again at those different values for saturation, field capacity, permanent wilting. What's up? Yeah, and so we had kind of discussed this earlier um, that sandy soils will hold less water. So the water holding capacity of a sand is much less than the water holding capacity of a loam or a clay because of pore size. Because there are more surf there's more surface area in a clay than there is in a sand. So it can it just can't hold as much water. That's why anybody in nursery, horticulture, no one. In golf courses. Sense there. And then permanent wilting point is going to be at negative 10 to 15 bars. But each soil type has a different time frame for when it reaches negative 10 to 15 bars. And that that permanent wilting point is a combination of all of those. Y'all look like y'all are ready for lunch. We're going to stop there. All right. That's all I got for today. Oh, yeah. I like that. 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 I like that.